Welcome to our symposium for 2023. In this annual event, we provide an opportunity for you to hear from leaders in our field about issues important in the research we do, as well as for clinical and prevention practitioners, and this year is no exception. We have known for a long time that adolescent brains are undergoing dramatic changes, but the trajectory and development is not a straight line. How is brain development affected by the environment and experiences youth have, and how does brain development affect their behavior? Today's guest has been working on answering these questions. To lead the discussion is Dr. Olu Ejilori, a professor in the Department of Psychiatry at the University of Illinois, Chicago. With both an MD and PhD degree from Stanford University, he has studied the effects of stress hormones on the brain, explored major depression through neuroimaging, and is currently using computational neuroimaging techniques and digital biomarkers to better track and treat neuropsychiatric disorders. So his background makes him a perfect person to talk with our symposium guest today about her work understanding adolescent brain development. And now here's Dr. Edgelore. Thank you, Dr. Brody. As Dr. Galvan and I talk during this time, please feel free to email responses to symposium at uga.edu. That's symposium at uga.edu or post in YouTube chat. We will address them as we can. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Adriana Galvan, who is a professor of psychology at UCLA and director of the Develop Developmental Neuroscience Laboratory. She is widely celebrated for her work examining the neural mechanisms underlying adolescent behavior and how this knowledge can inform public policy. Today, we will talk with her about what she has learned and is learning. Welcome, Dr. Galvan. Hi, it's nice to see you. It's great to have you here, and I'm really excited to, to talk to you today about your work and, and what you've learned about the adolescent brain. Um, so I tend to work on the other end of the lifespan, working with older adults above the age of 60. What have you found in your work that makes the adolescent brain so special? So many things, but one, one of them is that the, the changes in the brain during adolescence coincide with a lot of physical changes. And so you really can't dissociate the biological changes that are triggered by puberty with the socio-emotional changes that happen with the environmental context and the maturational changes in the brain. And so the confluence of all of these things make adolescence the perfect age to transition into the next phase of life, which is, of course, adulthood. And with adulthood comes new responsibilities, changing social landscapes. And so the adolescent brain is really primed to take on the, these new challenges and to seek social bonds outside of the family, outside of your school group or, or what have you. Um, and so the adolescent brain is really good at seeking out novelty. Mm. There are changes in certain parts of the brain. One brain region is called the striatum, for example, that has traditionally been associated with increases in reward seeking behavior, but we now know is so important for learning. And so the adolescent brain is, um, is really ready to take on uh, new challenges as compared to younger children or older adults. So some of those adaptations that have developed to make the adolescent brain sort of um, adaptive for that changing environment, um, are there any downsides to those um, special aspects of the adolescent brain that maybe make us more um, apt to have mental health issues during that uh, critical time period? Mm -hmm. it, well, it depends on who you ask, right? <laughs> Adolescents would say that that they they have a newfound interest in taking risks or seeking out new social partners or romantic partners. Mm -hmm. um, but certainly, yes, you can't ignore the fact that there is an uptick in mental health onset during adolescence, particularly around anxiety or depression and life circumstances like a pandemic uh, might, might steer those trajectories in different ways. And, you know, it's not simply because of changes in the brain, but as I mentioned before, the changes in social landscape make adolescents more aware of themselves, of where they fit in with society, of where um, they may be getting needs met or not met. And so all of these things may render them um, more likely to, to exhibit symptoms of, of mental health. And I know that um, parents and, and adolescents themselves, educators 
are worried about this. Is this something that um, is is normative or are current conditions in our society creating conditions where adolescents have a greater increase in mental health? Um, so so it's hard to say, but uh, yeah. certainly during this time, we, we do see an uptick. And, and as somebody who also works as a clinician, I always wonder about sort of the role of neuroimaging and in, in helping us make that distinction between what might be normative versus what might be more pathological or related to a disorder. Yeah. Have you found anything in your work or related work that suggests that some of these changes in the adolescent brain that you can actually look at neuroimaging for signs of what might actually be abnormal versus what might be adaptive for the sort of normal changes that an adolescent is going through? Yeah. Well, you said exactly what I would say is that the brain is really good at adapting to the environment. And so if you've been raised in an impoverished environment or with a lot of adversity, adversity, your brain is really good at readjusting and saying, you know what, I should feel threatened in this context or I should feel rewarded in this context. And so um, it is it is the case that there are um, particular conditions that are going to enhance or facilitate or protect um, any trajectories that may be of concern. Mm -hmm. And and related to that, you know, we, we were talking a little bit about this altered um, social environment. And one of the things that's changed since I was an adolescent is sort of social media. Yeah. And I wonder if you've looked at how that impacts um, adolescent mental health and, and what might be some of the ways that are, are there healthy ways to engage with social media or, you know, do what some parents do and say, look, you, you cannot be on Twitter. You cannot right. be on um, any of these um, social media platforms because it's not good for you. Yeah. This is, this is the biggest question right now, right, is whether or not social media is negatively impacting the adolescent brain. And surpri maybe surprisingly, given what um, our assumption might be, the data linking mental health to social media use are actually quite thin. And in part, it's because social media changes so rapidly, it's challenging to keep pace with how particular uh, outlets like TikTok or YouTube, you know, whatever it is, how they directly impact the developing brain. But what we do know is that um, there are many factors that influence how adolescents are going to behave and the state of their mental health. So while social media may be one component that will influence them, mm -hmm. just as important are their school environments or their family life or things that um, that impact how they interact with others. You know, one concern about social media, whether or not it's directly related, um, is, is asking what is it precluding adolescents to do if you know they weren't on social media, are they um, not engaging with peers face to face as much? Are they losing sleep? And that's you know an area of interest of mine in particular. And th the jury's still out. The data on um, digital media is really in its infancy. And luckily, there's a lot of interest in in examining this. But sometimes I wonder if if the interest in social media follows the same pattern that we've seen historically about concerns over the use of television or, you know, regular phones or, in, you know, many generations ago, um, even reading or, or access to, to books, whether, uh, and there was concern that, you know, those impacted negatively adolescent development. So um, is it just another wave of, of technology and mm -hmm. concerns about that? Or is it truly a unique um, influence is, is yet to be determined? Yeah. So, so it sounds like from, because there's a lack of clear evidence that maybe some of these concerns are, are overblown. Mm -hmm. But I wonder how you would advise, you know, parents now with, with young kids in terms of whether there is actually a healthy way yeah. to engage with, yes. with these apps. Yes, exactly. Oh, right. Yeah, that's what you said. About it. So absolutely. I think that, well, first of all, as with any behavior, young people model parental behavior or, you know, the, mm. the behavior they see in society. And so, um, kind of checking in on our own use is important. But also, as with any other behavior or um, skill that adolescents acquire during this time of life, adolescent or adults really serve an important function of showing them the appropriate or healthy way to, to engage in these behaviors, whether it is social media use or sexual behavior or driving behavior. All of these things are things we will in eventually need to master. And 
because of this transition time during adolescence, it's a perfect opportunity to scaffold that that skill development that, um, you know, social media is a skill as anything else, I think. Yeah. So, mm-hmm. so one of the things that I think about with with social media use and, and apps uh, like TikTok, where they've really optimized the algorithm mm-hmm. to have people engaged and and sort of get that quote unquote dopamine hit mm-hmm. um, every time they use the app. And I was thinking about how that intersects with your work on reward responsivity in, yeah. in adolescence and wondering if the way these apps work, maybe they're actually optimized to kind of hook teenagers yeah. in a way that it won't hook uh, adults. I don't yeah. know if you've, you've looked at that or thought about that. Yeah, well, I haven't looked at it directly, but I have thought about it. So I don't think that the social media companies have, tar- you know, have have designed the the with the tool to um, to specifically target adolescents. But we do know that by very nature of the adolescent brain, whatever the reward is, whatever the stimulus is, whether it is social media or money or you know attractive faces or, or whatever it is. The dopamine system, which is a neurotransmitter that is responsive to reward, will be more reactive during adolescence. And for a long time, there was a negative narrative around that. The idea was that, well, adolescents are just a little bit wild because their dopamine is out of control. And the truth is that dopamine is more than just a reward signal, but it's also a learning signal. Mm -hmm. So whenever we learn something new, your brain releases a little bit of dopamine. And in many adolescent contexts, everything is new, everything is rewarding because it's, they're learning about something. Right. And so whether social media is another way to learn about the world, maybe the number of likes you get as adults, we say, why do you care so much about it? But from an adolescent perspective, um, social status is really important. It is adaptive for them to care about their their cohort, about what their peers think of them. And this isn't just relevant for humans or for this generation, but across generations, across species, mm-hmm. Gaining social status is one way to evaluate how you are relative to your conspecifics. So um, obviously I'm extrapolating a lot from from this question, but I I, I think that um, our narrow focus on social media and maybe the negative ramifications may preclude our identifying ways in which, as you mentioned earlier, we can promote healthy use of of the tool or, or, or the technology. Yeah, I, I totally agree. And I often see um, technology as a double edged sword that it, or it's a tool, right? It could be used yeah. for harm or it could be used for good. And I think like any tool, right? Right, yeah. right. We can't just throw it out and we have to think about, you know, if kids are using this already, how can we have them use it in a healthy way that promotes their mental health and not That's harm right. it in any way? So and yeah. there are examples of that. So Nick Allen at the University of Oregon has a really um, fascinating tool aim to identify when a a young person may be in mental health crisis or using the tool to predict when they Mm -hmm. will engage, you know, have a mental health crisis. And that's, I think, one example of a positive attribute of the fact that they're going to be on the tool anyway, maybe monitor or evaluate their behavior while they're using it. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Um, You know, one of the things that you you mentioned earlier, something that I've increasingly um, thought about, especially since I work in, in the city of Chicago, where there are a lot of um, stressful environments for kids to grow up in where they're exposed to um, poverty and they're exposed to crime. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about how your work informs maybe how these um, stressful environments may Mm -hmm. impact the developing adolescent brain. Well, you probably know a lot more about stress (laughs) than I do, but um, I think we both know that stress you know, first, let's be explicit about it does impact the developing brain, right? That Mm -hmm. our brain has particular receptors or locks and keys that respond to our environment, whether that's positive or negative. Um, And stress is, is not excluded from that. And so stress was developed or, you know, over time in nature to, um, to motivate, right? To Mm -hmm. move. To if you're in a particularly dangerous situation, to move out of it or to, to respond. Um, but over time, if there's an accumulation of stress, the brain is it's going to tax the brain into being in a high stress reactivity mode all the time. And that isn't just stressful for the brain, but for the entire body. Right. Um, and um, and so I wouldn't say that our goal is to minimize stress, but to create conditions in which particular adolescents don't have undue stress that will generate, you know, um, you know, disadvantage later. 
Right. Absolutely. What about um, you? What do you what what's, what would your answer to that be? Yeah, I mean, I think it it definitely has an impact. One of the um, uh, analyses that we did recently was to look at the impact of neighborhood deprivation on the relationship between um, inflammation and mm -hmm. depression. Um, mm -hmm. So it's been well established that people with depression tend to have higher levels of of inflammation, mm -hmm. um, and we examine this relationship in participants who self-identified as white versus black. And we found that those that um, identified as black, we did not see this relationship between inflammation and, and depression that has been well established in the literature. And one of the reasons why we didn't see that relationship is that if you looked at our black participants without depression, they already had high levels of That's these right. uh, yes. pro-inflammatory cytokines, the signs of inflammation that were partially explained by these environmental factors, mm -hmm. these neighborhood factors, things like lack of access to healthy food, levels of crime, sense of belonging in the neighborhood. All yeah. of these factors contribute to a stressful state that sort of decoupled the relationship between inflammation and depression. That's really interesting. And that, you know, everything that you listed is a basic need, right? We're not talking yeah. about stress like they're overwhelmed with schoolwork or something like right. that. That too plays into it. But deprivation of basic needs is going to have important ramifications on people who, who are not receiving them and chronically not receiving them generationally, not just in their own family, but across, you know, their, their, their history. Yeah. So, um, that is the challenge. And how do we create systems and societies where people are not deprived of basic needs? And that's, that's really a big challenge. for our young Yeah. And, and increasingly, I'm glad to see this focus on sort of the structural determinants mm -hmm. of, of mm -hmm. mental health and, mm -hmm. and thinking about things that we can manipulate in our, in our environment to promote mm -hmm. um, mental health. Mm -hmm. And, and related to that, um, I was thinking about what would you prescribe for society to do to support adolescent mental health based on, on your work and your understanding of what are the needs of the adolescent brain during development? Well, I don't know if you're setting me up, but what I would say <laughs> is something that folks might not think about, but I think sleep is one thing that all of us have access to and, and know what it is. And um, sleep is so important. I, we, I don't need to tell anybody, right? We all know mm -hmm. as adults, as babies, you know, when we have babies, how important sleep is for, for development and for emotion regulation and for learning, for attention. Um, but during adolescence, there's a dip in the amount of sleep kids get. In part, a little bit is that social media, but actually not as much as you would think. A little bit of that is academics, but their brain is wired in a way where they don't get sleepy until later in the night. And mm -hmm. so that coupled with early school time is gonna compress how much sleep they get. Um, but what we've done, we've done some research on sleep environments and looking across young people who have, who live in different um, socioeconomic neighborhoods. Mm. And what we find is that the sleep conditions make a big difference, not just their motivation for sleep, but how comfortable mm. is your bedding? How loud is the noise? Um, do you have good heat or, you know, or cooling systems yeah. in the house? And this comes back to the basic needs that when we, 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 condition young people to not get good sleep because of the environments they are in, that's one, I think, relatively easy tool we can use for people to be most present in school the next day, to have better emotion regulation, mm -hmm. to be paying attention. Um, so I have a lot of interest in sleep. And, you know, one one thing we learned in a recent study is that kids who, um, who report not having a comfortable pillow uh, have, I wouldn't say delayed brain development, but the, the brain connections are not getting formed as quickly as those mm. who have optimal pillows or optimal mattresses. And relative to what we spend on a lot of other things, it seems like it would be a relatively simple intervention to ensure that the sleep environment is optimal for kids of all ages, kids of all socioeconomic status. Um, so anyway, it, it, that's one thing I would, I would say is important. And, you know, one last point about that is that you probably know better than I, but the relation between sleep and mental health is really mm. strong, regardless of age and regardless of disorder. If someone is suffering from anxiety or depression or something else, clinicians often ask, well, how are you sleeping? And they say, well, it's crap. You know, it's so bad. And so it really is, um, whether it's a cause or an effect, almost maybe doesn't matter, but it is right. related to it. Yeah.
Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And and I and I'm glad that, you know, you you highlighted the importance of sleep because I think it's something that we don't um we we ask about clinically, but what we don't ask about is the environment mm -hmm. that you referred to, right? Mm -hmm. You know, do you have a comfortable place to sleep? Do you have a quiet place to sleep? Like yeah. all of those things we often don't consider yeah. but are really important. You have a consistent place to sleep. Oh, a consistent place to sleep. You know? Exactly. Yeah. A, um, some of my research has been um involved in in the in the juvenile justice system or um you know incarceration and detention and you know even very simple pictures paint a picture of very inadequate sleep conditions for mm -hmm. young people who are incarcerated um, the mattresses are very thin sometimes they don't right. follow the lights are on all night that is not conducive to good sleep and right. knowing the impact of sleep deprivation on emotion regulation to take one example well, it's no surprise then that there are impulsivity issues among, mm -hmm. among um, mm -hmm. these kids. So I think we miss an opportunity to to help young people thrive as much as they can by providing the basic needs that they need. Yeah. Have there been any studies to look at whether, you know, sort of improving the sleep environment for <laughs> kids that are in the juvenile justice system lead to better, you know, like less recidivism, <gasps> you know, less acts of, you know, impulsivity or violence in, in those settings? Yeah. Well, that's a study I want to do. That's my dream. Okay. <laughs> in that. But I do have a collaborator in Texas who's not ex not doing an intervention, but even simply an examination. What is the mm. relation between these sleep conditions and these behavioral outcomes right. that we're talking about. I suspect it's high. Yeah, I, I suspect it's the same. And and I think, um, you know, and, and I think you you highlighted it very um, uh, sort of correctly that it's low hanging fruit as yeah. far as as far as an intervention that may be helpful and have a lot of impact um, in improving the mental health of a lot of kids. Exactly. Um, and it's know. so interesting because, sorry to cut you off, Go but ahead. When, when our kids are young babies, infants, we care a lot about their sleep, right? Mm -hmm. If you do a quick Google search about infant sleep, there's a lot of books, a lot of resources, consultants who come to your house and help you get optimize their sleep. But once they become teenagers, maybe it's because parents start to feel as though this is one thing they could give up control over, right? They can say, okay, you set your own bedtime. Mm -hmm. You can choose, you know, if you use social media or not. And unfortunately, that has ramifications on how much sleep the young people are getting. And so that you know, the, the point is that they fall off, you know, in our yeah, own sense, yeah. we ask, did you know that, you know, Jimmy hates his pillow? They said, yeah, I never asked him. You know, I had no idea that he was so uncomfortable every night. So um, that's a missed opportunity. Right. But it's funny, though, you talk about how we sort of let kids determine their own um, sleep times, but we don't um, when they go to sleep, but we don't let them determine when they wake up, right? Because exactly, of <laughs> exactly. We don't let them determine. And, you know, if you in 2014, the American Academy of Pediatrics said, the data are inequal. You should absolutely start school later because the kids, mm -hmm. you know, whatever it follows their circadian rhythm didn't really happen. Seattle was a good example of where it did happen. But mm -hmm. um, despite the data, we, we don't we don't acknowledge the, the circadian patterns of adolescents. Why, why do you think that hasn't um, taken off more or been adopted by more school districts? Yeah. There are so many reasons. A lot of it has to do with the fact that and this come back, comes back to your earlier question about what makes the adolescent brain unique. The adult brain is not interested in sleeping in later. And so we are on an adult-based schedule. So adults work, parents work. And so they want their kids to start school when they start their, their work time. Um, also, there's concern that then kids wouldn't be open or available to do after-school sports or that the, um, they would get more homework if it went later into the night. And so there's just a lot of structural, coming back to the structural question, a lot mm -hmm. of structural barriers to um, to adopting a later school starts time. But, you know, there are some schools that, that do um, do do, uh, do that, but it's not as wide. it hasn't taken off mm -hmm. like it should. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No. Um, and so related to sort of, you know, public policy and society-wide implementation of, of changes in policy, informed by the science. I was wondering if you could speak a little bit about the impact of your work on mm -hmm. kids in the juvenile, juvenile justice system mm -hmm. and whether um, people think about sentencing differently, mm -hmm. they think about what is the you know goal of the juvenile justice system in a different way yeah. based on, on some of the work that you've done. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, things vary state to state. And so there isn't one universal um, uh, 
adoption of, of any one uh, principle. But originally, the juvenile justice system was set up to support young people, right, to if they were in trouble, or if they had um, made decisions, maybe they shouldn't have made that this was a way to rehabilitate. Mm -hmm. um, the pendulum really swung in the 80s and 90s, so that now um, the juvenile justice system or incarceration has seen an uptick in the number of young people who are tried as adults. And so in our work, focus on adolescent brain development. Um, whenever I get called in to, to make, you know, give testimony or, or opine on the juvenile justice system, it's about when is an adolescent an adult? And you know, the other frame on that is when can I hold them accountable for a behavior they conduct, they did when they were 17 or 18? And the age of majority in this country is 18. Um, and we know that the adolescent brain continues beyond that. And so there's a natural tension between knowing the brain is still changing, that the plasticity or the malleability of the brain mm -hmm. is still changing through the early 20s. And yet if a person is incarcerated, let's say, and tried as an adult and found to be guilty and, and sentenced to life in prison, um, that is really precluding the opportunity for the development that we know will uh, mm -hmm. keep on going if they weren't incarcerated. Right. And so... Um, I think a lot about this very simple, seemingly simple question about when do we transition into adulthood and how can we um, sanction young people who should be held accountable if they committed a heinous crime, but what is the appropriate sanction right. for um, individuals of this age group if the goal is to support healthy outcomes? Yeah. And, and I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit more about this um, sort of the time range of adolescence, right? Yeah. Because when I think when I traditionally thought about it, you know, before I, I learned more about the about the field, I thought about, you know, a teenager is a teenager, right? 13 to 18 or 13 to 19. But, you know, when we talk about adolescence from from a more scientific standpoint, it, it's a broader range, right? It really is. Yeah. And maybe we can show that first slide. I think maybe it's the first or the second slide. Yeah. Um, so this is showing that adolescence really spans um, the period of about age 10 when puberty first um, strikes for, for many young people through about age 25. And so the, the, the first boundary is set by biological changes related to puberty and, uh, you know, attaining your first menstrual period for girls and, you know, uh, you know, let's say facial hair for boys. Um, and the other upper boundary is a little fuzzier because it both incorporates brain development, which we know continues through the early 20s, but also the attainment of adult roles, mm -hmm. um, you know, being financially secure, or stable, maybe um, finishing college or some higher degree or becoming a parent. All of these things are societally driven. And so how we decide who is considered an adult really varies by culture, by country, by, you know, by, by, by a lot of different things. And so Anyway, so that's all to say, it's hard to know when exactly <laughs> adolescence ends, um, which obviously comes into play in, in questions in, in the legal system. But the important thing to note from this slide is that there are distinct phases of development during adolescence. So obviously an 11-year-old is very different from a 19-year-old. And yet we kind of group them all together. Mm. So how can we as scientists support young people when there's such diversity in their developmental stage? And that's really it. I think a challenge and an interesting one um, for developmental scientists. And and what might be some of the things that influence that sort of rate of development? Or have you noticed? Or are there clearer um, uh, factors, either both internally, biologically, mm -hmm. or externally, from a societal standpoint, that might drive development to proceed in a faster fashion or a slower fashion? Yeah, that's such an interesting question. Well, certainly, uh, having an adult role or adult responsibility sooner rather than later mm -hmm. will accelerate development. So um, I did some research. Well, actually, my graduate student did some research a few years ago examining young kids, young people who have um, responsibilities in their family, either. So in this case, it was Mexican-American adolescents who either did language brokering for their family or did a lot of child care for their family. And what we found is that their brain development was distinct from their peers who didn't have these responsibilities. And so that's one example of how the environment helps shape the mm -hmm. development of the mm -hmm. cortex. Um, on the other hand, coming back to stress, there is, are some data showing that um, 
uh, adolescents who have a very stressful environment undergo puberty sooner. And mm -hmm. that is so fascinating because what, you know, there are so many ecological evolutionary biology theories about why that happens, but um, the, the data are pretty consistent that that is the case. Yeah. There are also some links with ethnicity. So Mexican and black youth are more likely to undergo puberty sooner than their white peers. Mm. And, so, and, and, and do you think that that's probably more culturally related? And, and I think what you highlight too is the importance of, you know, doing these studies in diverse samples. There was a recent paper by Jocelyn Ricard in Nature Neuroscience talking about how a lot of, especially large scale neuroimaging studies have been hampered somewhat by not having diverse samples. Yes. I think the um, uh, ABCD study has been much better <laughs> yes. at that. Um, I was wondering if you could talk about how you work to make sure that you have diverse samples um, involved in your studies. Yeah, that's such a good question. And that was such an important paper to highlight this deficit in the field. And thank goodness there's acknowledgement of it, but mm -hmm. we do have a lot of work to do to make um, our studies more representative. Um, so I'm at UCLA, as you know, and I am fortunate to be in a city as diverse as Los Angeles, where we can really um, uh, reach those um, you know, diverse populations. And so what we do is pretty simple strategies of partnering with folks in the community, with um, partnering with different school districts. We also aim to have our consent forms and our procedures um, in Spanish and English, as you know, Los Angeles mm -hmm. is heavily populated by Latino populations. And so that has certainly helped. But as I mentioned, we have a lot of work to do because it's not simply the case of opening the doors for everyone and they will come. There's right. a lot of work to be done in terms of establishing trust and establishing accountability to communities that have historically been um, not received that kind of treatment. And mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. um, we, we try to think about it from that perspective as well. But, um, but I agree with you. These large data sets are doing a better job at least acknowledging the need for right. populations. Right. So what are some of the ways that you've worked to establish trust in these, in these communities? Mm -hmm. And because and, I know I can, I can imagine that it's a, it's a major barrier to getting people involved. There might be some resistance. Yes. Um, so what, what are some of the techniques that, that you use yeah. to, to garner trust in the community? Yeah. Well, I think it's um, one is to, to speaking with these communities with humility. So, um, you know, reaching out to the leaders of the communities, explaining what the goal is, explaining and acknowledging the historical um, uh, suspicion reasons why they may be suspicious mm -hmm. of, of engaging with universities and, and research studies. Um, I am fortunate to speak Spanish. I grew up in a, in, in a, bilingual, I, I was going to say bilingual, but it's actually monolingual Spanish in my households. And so, um, I, I very much appreciate that I can speak to them in, mm -hmm. in native language of, of Spanish. Um, so I think that does some work to, to support. Um, also not simply sending research staff, although research staff are of course valuable, having the, the principal investigator of a, of a study show up to be mm -hmm. present. I answer the questions, I think, um, goes a long way. But um, again, there's there's always work to be done and it's a lot of relationship building. Yeah, I mean, one of the things that we've tried to do a little bit and I've tried to do personally a little bit is, um, mm -hmm. you know, talk about research in the community and, and to give something back, right? Whether it's, mm -hmm. you know, giving it back to an individual participant who participates in the study or to a larger community. And, and you've done a great job with, with science communication. I had a chance to look at some of your, your TED Talks. I was wondering if you could speak about that experience and, and what like the feedback has been like, what, what that was like for you. Yeah, gosh, if I if I had known that that was gonna go up on YouTube, that first TED Talk, I would have, <laughs> I would have done it differently. But um, I, I think just realizing that as scientists, sometimes we're not trained in science communication and mm -hmm. that we need to be because it is, I, you know, there's obviously varying degrees of opinions on this, but as scientists, it is our responsibility to translate the science because science is jargony and there's a lot of, mm -hmm. you know, challenging concepts and, and, free, and um, words to understand, but to make it accessible to the folks who are giving their time and effort and energy into providing us with the ability to, to understand better in our case, adolescents or mental health um, is really important. And I just wish that in our graduate programs, there was actually better intentional work on training us to communicate either verbally or mm -hmm. in the written form or however it is. 
um, because it is such an important part of engaging with the folks we aim to, to support. Yeah, absolutely. I think I think it's an important, um, underappreciated part of, of the role of being a, a scientist is yeah. being able to communicate your findings to the general okay. public and, and to give something back yeah. um, in terms of the, the knowledge that you've gained as part of your work. Yeah. So I, I was glad to very, I'm very glad to see that you've done yeah. that really well. <laughs> Thank you. Um, uh, so uh, one, one question I have comes mm -hmm. out of, um, so I have a, a bad habit of watching a lot of like kind of trashy TV. <laughs> and so there's, yeah. there's a show called The Parent Test. Uh -huh. I don't know if you've seen it, but um, basically it's, it's, a, it's a competition game show where different par parenting styles are pitted against each other, right? Mm -hmm. So you have the helicopter parents, yeah. the free range parents, the disciplined parents, mm -hmm. the, you know, the negotiation parents and the child led parents all sort of vying for who has the best parenting style and they face different challenges with their kids of different ages and i was thinking about like what style do you think works best uh, in managing the adolescent brain given all the things that you highlighted about what's special about it that's a really good question and i love to hear that there's developmental science in you know in tv that's really <laughs> funny i should really check it out um well the answer is that obviously no one parenting style is going to be a magic bullet and youth don't grow up in a vacuum anyway. So even if you have, if we said, okay, this is the parenting style that's going to work, it's not going to work for everyone. And not just because each individual has their own biology and mm -hmm. history and way of viewing the world, but because parenting is one aspect of what's going to contribute to their developmental trajectory. School, community, friends, all of those things are going to impact it. Um, and not all adolescents are obviously going to respond in the same manner. So kind of having, a, a, I, don't, I don't remember what you said, but like a, the free range parent may yeah. work with child number one, but not with child number two. And that that's certainly the case in my family where I have two kids and you know, <laughs> work for one and not for the other. Um, but what is important, regardless of the parenting style, is that it is established before the young person becomes an adolescent, right? right? You can't swoop in as, a, you know, now you're an adolescent parent and be very, uh, you know, discipline driven or, mm -hmm. you know, the opposite. Um, and so establishing those relationships before is obviously very important. And that also comes back to the social media question about um, being along with them on the journey of whatever skill they're mm -hmm. trying to acquire should mm -hmm. happen sooner rather than later. Um, but we also know that sustaining the parenting relation, parent-child relationship is equally important during adolescence. Sometimes there's a misconception that as young people become teenagers, they don't care about their parents or focus on their friends. And there's actually really great work um, by Eva Telzer, who's at UNC, showing that parents remain as important to the young person as, um, as friends do and as they mm -hmm. were before they were teenagers. And so I guess the message is don't give up on, on trying to be their <laughs> friend or trying to be their support system because they um, the connections are just just as valuable yeah. as before. But it's really interesting that you talked about the sort of consistency of parenting mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. throughout development, even pre-adolescence into mm -hmm. the adolescent period, that, that it's important to maintain that consistency, yeah. even though your child is changing. Yeah, exactly. Right? And that's and, what's hard, right? Because yeah. as they change, you want to change too, right? If right. they become more rebellious, you want to become more combative. And so that that's really hard, but um, it, yeah. it's what the Yeah, yeah. That's very interesting. So what are you working on now that that you're really excited about? Yeah, well, you know, as I mentioned before, the sleep stuff, I, I love it. I think sleep is so important. We're finding new ways to monitor sleep in the natural environment. But um, that's one thing. Another uh, thing I'm really excited about is I have a collaborator named Tara Paris, and we've been doing a study of um, starting with kids at age nine who showed signs of anxiety. And we mm -hmm. followed them for a few years now. It's been three or four years. And initially we were interested in examining the factors that exacerbate the anxiety. So if they show signs of anxiety at age nine, by the time they're 11 or 13, um, what made their anxiety worse? But what we find is that we're more, we've become more interested in the factors that diminish their anxiety. So what are the protective factors? One of them is sleep, unsurprisingly, that's because I look for it, <laughs> but that's not the only thing. But other things are what I just mentioned, You know strong family support systems. Um, having one consistent best friend is a really good predictor of the resilience or 
I wouldn't say aging out of anxiety, but managing the anxiety. Mm -hmm. um, and so we, we haven't finished the study, but we've simply become more interested in it on the flip side, right? We yeah. always kind of think about mental health exacerbating, but as you you know mentioned earlier, there's adolescence is, is, is a time of dynamic change in mental right. health. So some go up and some go down. And so focusing in on how we can um, lift up the factors that, that diminish poor mental health may be a way to, um, to, to go. Right. And, and really, I'm, I'm glad, so glad that you're focusing on these uh, resilience factors and, mm -hmm. and things that might um, mitigate risk for developing mental health problems. Cause I think we often focus on the negative so yeah. much that we don't think about what are things that people do to support their own mental health. Yeah. And, and um, so I think that's, that's really great. Yeah. And have you thought then about how those resilience factors might be um, either implemented or supported or developed as, as an intervention. I know we talked a little bit about sleep, but these yeah. other ones that you mentioned, I think it'd be yeah. kind of interesting thinking about how to develop interventions or supports yeah. around those factors. Exactly. Yeah. So one thing we found, and, and this is um, kind of related to a different study I'm working on, is on pro-social behavior. So we know that among adults, engaging in pro-social behavior or altruism when you're feeling down really lifts you up. Mm -hmm. And that hasn't been examined so much in young people, but in our data, we find that those who report volunteering or just naturally inclined to support their friends, um, it, it boosts their own feelings, you know, positive feelings. And leveraging the fact that adolescents are inclined to, to hang out with their peers or really have an interest in forming social bonds, perhaps that could be an intervention to mm. see, you know, if, if we actually support it, instead of saying, you know, you're too much hanging out with your friend, um, would we support their, um, you know, feelings of, of anxiety or depression or whatever else? Yeah, yeah, that that, mm -hmm. that makes a lot of sense. And um, have you worked, uh, you know, or have you talked about with schools about ways to sort of maybe develop programs or or um, systems to sort of create these opportunities for for kids to do this within the school environment? That would be amazing. We have not, but that would be such a great thing. Um, you know, th but there are some scholars who have been able to 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 leverage their knowledge into school wide systems. So. Um, Betsy Palak, I don't know if you're familiar with her work, but mm -hmm. she's at Princeton and she, she's amazing. She's, she studies networks and social networks and has been able to go into every school in New Jersey and, um, uh, introduce an intervention whereby people are doing, you know, this kind of thing that I'm talking about pro social behavior. And she doesn't look at their brain development or anything, but she simply sees changes or decreases in antisocial behavior among mm -hmm. the kids who are most integrated into the social network. So, um, all that is to say that we should leverage what adolescents are naturally good at, which is to, to seek out rewards, right. to hang out with their friends, and to be a part of a group right. um, rather than, um, you know, um, penalizing it. That makes perfect sense. Mm -hmm. And and related to that, I was thinking about, the, especially in the Chicago area, there's been a lot of attention to bullying mm -hmm. and student mental health. And I was wondering if... Um, if you've seen in, in your own work or related work, whether bullying is something, you know, when I think about it, what comes to mind is usually younger kids, like mm -hmm. pre-adolescent. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if, if it's something that changes as we move into the adolescent years, does it get better? Does it get worse as we get into those teenage and older years? It's a good question. Well, I think, you know, I don't know the numbers in terms of um, quantifying the the magnitude of the bullying, but certainly the way bill bullying plays out may change. Mm -hmm. um, one is that as they use social media more so, that may impact, you know, the, the medium by which bullying happens. Right. But also there's different forms of bullying. So um, there's a well-established literature on girls versus boys in terms of the bullying that they experience. And with the girls, it's more likely to be relational bullying and, you know, gossiping and things like that. And so um, I think, you know, just really paying attention to, the ways in which people, not just young people, hurt each other um, is really important. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I, but but going back to what you mentioned before, with um, you know, enhancing pro-social behaviors, mm -hmm. uh, enhan enhancing positive, rewarding experiences for teenagers, I think you know is is definitely the way to go. And yeah. you know, I think about my own adolescence and and the rewarding experiences that I had 
doing volunteer work and, um, you know, I was even reminiscing about some of the work that I did uh, as, a, as a teenager doing um, volunteer work uh, with the American Red Cross and, and how, what a positive experience that was. Yeah, or even working, not even volunteer work, but working. I, I really, same thing. I had such positive experiences from having an after school job and feeling like mm -hmm. I was contributing to my family, which is another yeah. form of activism, right? Is, um, is feeling as though your behavior, or your thoughts matter is also absolutely, really absolutely. So, I think we have a, a question, uh, okay. from the audience. Okay, uh, it's what are some, what are some important next steps for research about adolescent health? Well, I think that um, I'm going to ask you the same question in a second, but, I, you know, from my perspective, some of the important next steps is acknowledging that adolescent health matters. So um, if, for example, if we, we recently did a scan, I'm a part of the Center for the Developing Adolescent at UCLA, and we just recently did a scan on the governmental dollars that are spent on adolescent health or health among people who are developing. For infants and young children, it's pretty high. We're doing pretty well on how much we invest in, in their health. But for adolescents, there's a dip. Um, you know, there are many caucuses in, you know, in government. There's not one adolescent caucus. And I think that's really telling about where we, how we think about adolescents. And in mm -hmm. part, it's because they are in this transition phase. Are they children? Are they adults? And that leads to this, you know, kind of ambiguity about where the investment should go. But I think that's an important next step for adolescent health. Yeah, what about you? What absolutely. Would you so, I mean, I think um, building up those resilience factors, I think are mm -hmm. really important. Um, at uh, our institution, University of Illinois, Chicago, mm -hmm. we have the Urban Youth Trauma Center, mm -hmm. which is designed to give kids who have been exposed to um, uh, violence uh, mm -hmm. tools for managing their mental health. So it mm -hmm. doesn't lead to PTSD. It doesn't lead to depression, mm -hmm. um, given the sort of, you know, horrendous environmental circumstances that a lot of these kids are growing up in. So I think the more that we can do to build resilience as well as try to address the original yeah. traumatic events in the first place, I think that's definitely where we need to, to put a lot of resources towards. I agree. And along with what you just said is, is also a story of acknowledgement, right? Like if you mm -hmm. are giving them tools for um, building up the resilience, that's acknowledging that what they're facing. Exactly. Yeah. Right. Exactly. I think that that's a really good point. And I think we're even um, kind of hopefully expanding our sense of what trauma could mm. be or what it could mean, especially for young, younger folks um, mm. that, you know, that things that um, we traditionally consider trauma has been too limited to encompass some of the things that we see clinically mm -hmm. in a lot of these um, adolescents, um, especially right. here in, in Chicago. Um, yeah, I think it makes important point and you know just even societally how, what current event how current events impact young people's development yeah. and mental health is really important so obviously the pandemic is one good example but i've recently been in conversation with a lot of people examining what they call um eco anxiety so mm. concern about the environment and young people are at the forefront of thinking about climate change for example as opposed to some adults. And so acknowledging the fact that they're experiencing the world in a different way will also, um, you know, help us better support them. Yeah, absolutely. Or even thinking about, you know, this, the, the terrible sort of epidemic of school shootings, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, exactly. and having young kids having to do active yep. shooter drills in That's preschool, right. that That's that right. in and of itself can create a lot of, of, of this trauma. That's exactly right. That, and it's, the message is sent is that the world isn't safe, right? That right. if we have security guards posted everywhere, I recognize why there feels to be a need for that, but it does send a, a different message right. about what's mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, I believe we have another question from the audience. Um, this is from Don Bauer. Please speak to precocious puberty and pr brain mm -hmm. development. Yeah, this is such an interesting question. So um, just for those who may not be as familiar with precocious puberty, it's the notion that some kids undergo puberty earlier than is typical for their for their peers. And um, precocious puberty is interesting. It seems to have different um, effects on males versus females. So for females, precocious puberty has been associated with higher rates of mental illness or um, symptoms like anxiety and depression. Whereas for males, um, less so. And, um, you know, the relation to, to brain development has not been studied very well. Um, and the focus has instead been more on 
are the kids with precocious puberty undergoing higher levels of stress? And that does seem to be the case. But again, the data are pretty thin on that. But yeah. That, that's that's really fascinating. Any any thoughts of so you said the the sex differences might be related to levels of, of stress. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's so interesting. Yeah. Um and and has there been any further work to look at where the sources of that stress differential comes from? It, no. I mean, you know, a lot of it's socioeconomic stress that mm -hmm. has a lot to do mm -hmm. with it, but um ju you know, just the trauma that we were talking about earlier. Great. Mm -hmm. um, so we have another question, um, uh, and this is about whether the, the kind of research that you do, can you do that without an R01? Yeah. Yeah. It's a really good question. And, you know, the related question, MRIs and biologicals are expensive to do. That's absolutely right. They are so expensive to do. And, you know, I, I am fortunate to have um, grants to do fMRI research, but I will admit that I often ask, do we what is the added value of doing the MRI, right? If I'm in, if I'm interested in, in the relation between sleep and anxiety, it's nice to have a mechanistic, potentially mechanistic understanding, but from the brain, but I don't actually need that to, to link sleep and anxiety. I don't need the brain to show that an intervention will ameliorate anxiety symptoms if, if we improve the sleep. And so, um, the answer to this question is, I hope a feel good one that I, the research can't be done without an R01. And I've often found that the smaller grants that I receive, um, maybe, maybe because the dollars are tighter that I, I find sometimes the research is better. So my interest in sleep, um, evolved actually when I became a parent and was not getting sleep, <laughs> I really wondered about, <laughs> um, but before that, so I, Anyway, so I got a, basically a training grant, a seed grant to, with very little money um, to start studying sleep. And that really kicked off a whole area of research on um, on the smallest grant I had received. So anyway, but what do you think? Olu? Yeah. So one of the things that we do in, in our studies is that we we're fortunate also to get grants to do the expensive MRIs. But we're trying mm -hmm. to link it with other measures that might be more easily implementable and, and disseminable. So like uh you know, using ecological momentary assessment yeah. where we track how people are mm -hmm. doing on their smartphones mm -hmm. or using okay. passive sensing from yes. Fitbits or, um, you know, yes. a colleague of mine, Dr. Alex Liao developed an app called BioEffect that tracks how you type on your phone. Oh, and so wow. we can infer wow. information about, you know, mood states and cognition. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. what we're trying to do is link that to what we measure in the brain with MRI so that if the digital biomarkers are a good proxy for what we can measure with MRI, then we don't need MRI. That's right. We get some of the same insights, right? That's um, exactly right. So, so that's some of the work that we're doing now to see if we can use these, you know, cheaper, more ubiquitous yes. types of technology to substitute for what we can measure with MRI and, and more expensive methods. And I would add that the methods that you men mentioned are more ecologically valid, right? Right. Absolutely. These are happening in the natural realistic environment, whereas the MRI is obviously a very artificial environment. The tasks that you present when they're in the scanner are maybe not typical to what you're trying to really measure. So um, the MRI gives really pretty pictures that may not <laughs> always be necessary. Yeah, but I think we're seeing a lot more work kind of linking the two. I have uh, one of my colleagues, Dr. Cope Fuhrer, she's interested in um, stress generation and, and stress and its relationship to depression in teens. Mm -hmm. And so She's doing ecological momentary assessments while the kids are in school oh, wow. and then linking that to, you know, measures of stress in the scanner. Um, and so I think the more we kind of link these two types of measures, the more we can use those um, cheaper, cheaper technologies. Yeah, exactly. But great question. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. So I'm trying to see if we have any more questions yeah. from the audience. Yeah. Um, I don't see any, but it's been a real pleasure talking with you and, and, yeah. and talking about all of your exciting work. Um, and Thank I and you. I really look forward to seeing um, what further is going to come out of your lab. And um, and I and when my daughter becomes a teenager, I, I will let her sleep in. <laughs> how, old, how old is she now? She's seven. Oh, okay. Yeah, you have a so little way to go. Yeah. Most of the time, but establish the sleep habits now, like I do with my kids. I think it's absolutely. Really um, yeah. So let me. Uh, oh. All 
I think I, I'm supposed to wrap up here, but I lost my, um, my wrap up message. Okay. Um, so thank you, Adriana, for talking with me today about your work. Um, mm -hmm. It's fascinating and important area of research. And as we look forward to more uh, from you in the future, um, a recording of this discussion will be available on the CFR YouTube page and website, and we encourage you to share it with others who may be interested. Thank you for listening, and I hope you all have a great day. Thank you. Bye.